everyone to, uh, to today's session, session eight, uh, the third session in the third day uh, of this conference on animal and uh, on US popular culture. And uh, today we're going to have two speakers talking about uh, wildlife related media discourses. And um, well, we're going to start with uh, Claudia uh, Alonso Recarte uh, from the University of Valencia uh, with a, uh, a, a talk uh, titled uh, The Tiger King Pop Culture Phenomenon and COVID-19 Media. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you can share your uh, yes. screen. Uh, yes. Give me a second. Me, I'm busy, I'm busy, honey. I, I will see you after, thank you. Sorry, my daughter. Can you see this properly? Yes. Okay, uh, all right. So I'll, uh, well, I wanna begin by thanking the organizers of the, of the conference for putting all this together. Um, unfortunately, I, I am missing quite a lot of papers that I would like to attend, but, um, as everybody, you know, uh, academic obligations, they're, they're keeping me from this. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, the Tiger King pop culture phenomenon and COVID-19 media. So what I want to do in this presentation is explore how discourses, meanings, and connotations associated with non-human animals during the pandemic uh, may have influenced audience perceptions, uh, audiences' perceptions of wildlife in Netflix's uh, hit seven-episode docu-series *Tiger King: Murder, Mayhem, and Madness*, uh, which was directed by Eric Good and Rebecca Chaikling. I'm guessing a lot of people have watched uh, *Tiger King*. Uh, probably a lot of people who are attending this conference. So. Um, Hopefully that, that will bring people to chi chime in if, if, need, if need be. Uh, so what I wanna do is explore how media discourses and stories on non-human animal otherness during the pandemic may have filtered themselves into the Tiger King narrative, offering metaphors and interpretations that of course the, uh, the creators of the show uh, could not have anticipated. Now, of course, the documentary was very problematic in terms of its treatment of captivity narratives uh, because it seemed very structurally torn between uh, this sort of unapologetic entertainment and an alleged conservationist agenda. But of course, the pop culture phenomenon that it became, um, and I think that's very pertinent to this particular conference on pop culture, um, well, it, that should not preclude its historization uh, within a highly convulsed era in which COVID was very much redefining human interactions and spatial encounters with non-human animal others. Uh, now, after uh, five years on, in, in the making, on March 20th, 2020, uh, Netflix released the docu-series and, and because of the success, there would be a, a, a second season, but initially it was gonna be just one uh, seven, seven, seven episode docu-series. And the show of course became this unexpected hit, right? So we have Nielsen ratings estimating that more than 30 million people um, watched it only in the first 10 days as word of mouth spread all over social media about a documentary on the gun-toting, eccentric, violent, and double-crossing individuals that kept, bred, abused, and exploited large cats and other captive wildlife in their poorly managed private and roadside zoos. It was a vivid sort of tongue-in-cheek portrayal of Trump's rural white America, and the show capitalized uh, very much on what seemed to be like this endless source of outrageous characters that populated the business, uh, some of which are in that picture down uh, on the left corner, and that's just the selection of them. And they were basically topped off by uh, Joe Exotic, who is the one on the top, right? Um, uh, his actual name being Joseph Maldonado Passage. So obviously Joe Exotic is sort of his, his stage name, if you will. Um, this gun-crazed former owner of the Greater Winniewood Zoo in Oklahoma, who sports his by now famous uh, bleached mullet and had a penchant for uh, vulnerable young men. 
So as a very much echoing 19th century freak shows, the docu-series paraded through interviews and preposterous footage, the bizarre and outlandish likes of the meth addicts and their enablers, the megalomaniacs, the unofficial murder suspects, the con artists, ex-convicts and felons that feuded against one another, and that culminated in a murder for hire subplot when Joe Exotic, well, technically attempted to hire someone to murder his, um, his, his prime adversary, which is the woman you see there, Carol Baskin. Okay, and that led to Exotic's 22 year prison sentence. Uh, the documentary came out when he was in prison. He st he's still in prison, of course. Um, and and it, so it very much blended reality television with true crime serials in terms of genre. And in the words of Lagerway and Negart, they wrote in reference to the series, all of these characters and behaviors are approached with the simplified pleasurable spectacle of meme culture. Now, as critics of the show uh, soon made very clear, the series indulgence in parodic and melodramatic character portrayal played very well with binging audiences, uh, but ultimately it overshadowed that contextual problem that had, according to the director, to where it good, uh, been the original reason for the making of the documentary, which was the fact that there were between 5,000 and 10,000 tigers being held captive in America, while only approximately 4,000 um, tigers remained in the wild. So for the most part, uh, the documentary fell frustratingly short from centralizing the discussion around proper conservation. And the prominent piece about this was uh, Rachel Neuer's um, article for the, the New York Times just a couple of weeks after the release uh, of the documentary in Netflix. Um, the article was significantly titled Why Tiger King is Not Blackfish for Big Cats. And if you've watched Blackfish, you know it's like a very, uh, very important anti-captivity documentary. And the Tiger King directors uh, at one point did state that Tiger King was similar to Blackfish, which is a very questionable, uh, you know, uh, assertion to make. But anyway, uh, Neuer's article pointed out that not only did the series fail to address the urgent situation of captive wildlife more adamantly, but also that it threatened to worsen the situation by creating, I quote, and you have that quote down there, a glamour around tiger ownership and assigning a folk heroism to the Joe Exotic personality that could set back efforts to end the abuse and ownership of big cats. Now, indeed, um, certain statements made by right-wing conservatives very much downplayed, and as we're very much used to now, they infantilize uh, the wildlife conservation issues at stake. Um, so when there were rumors that started, you know, going around that Joe Exotic was fishing for a, par for a presidential pardon from Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump Jr. went on air and he said the following, he said, you know what the real tragedy is right now from that whole show? None of us knew that you could have had a pet tiger for like two grand. Now, the flooding amount of internet memes flaunting the statements, the expressions, you know, all these, um, uh, you know, the phrases that, the, that, the, that were popularized by the docuseries characters, all of these further attested to the trivialization of wildlife preservation. Um, and they very much ring true with what Steve Baker famously wrote when he said, I quote, the animal is the sign of all that is taken not very seriously in contemporary culture, the sign of that which doesn't really matter, right? Um, and that still holds true. I'm not going to go through the memes. You can check them out um, because, we're, uh, because of time issue. But basically, they're borrowing um, expressions and and, and things that, you know, um, these characters' words and making memes out of that. So as critics noticed uh, very quickly, uh, there was a clear absence of uh, wild conserva uh, wildlife conservation experts, actual wildlife conservation experts uh, in the documentary. And they were replaced instead by all of these uninformed opinions of characters attempting to become these businessmen. Um, the second season would premiere on November 17th, 2021, and would follow suit with 
five more episodes in which sort of the criminal schemes only seem to grow larger. Um, nonetheless, despite all of this, despite the discursive flippancy, despite the overt focus on the human characters, um, the scattered details about animals' miserable lives in zoos and other types of facilities, um, I think, have become particularly or did become particularly noticeable by viewers on account of the circumstances surrounding the pandemic. Okay, now just nine days before the release of the docu-series, as we all know, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic and initiated this sort of gradual worldwide, worldwide lockdown with differing degrees of restrictions. And the second half of March, uh, if we all remember, uh, was indeed a particularly determining period for lockdown in Europe, in North America, in South America, in Africa, et cetera. So it seems reasonable um, to think that Tiger King, of course, would not have enjoyed the success that it did uh, had its release been, uh, been scheduled differently or had there not been a pandemic at all. Uh, the documentary came out at a time in which we had all of these narratives, hypotheses, uh, theories, debates about COVID saturating the media. And Tiger King, of course, offered the kind of digestible entertainment formula that provided fast and easy escapism. And sort of in, the, in, in this context of disturbed perceptions of time that came with lockdown, when we didn't know what to do without, uh, with our time, when time became very much unbearable and unbearable to think about, um, watching TV series and binging on screens could of course provide some sense of routine, it could provide the solace of escapism from the overwhelming ex excess of information and misinformation that was systematically being consumed and that offered very confusing, or maybe not confusing, but at least, in well, yeah, confusing and indeterminate, indefinite predictions regarding a vaccine, the flattening of the curve, uh, the end of quarantine, et cetera. So this might explain why a docu-series with apparently nothing to do with the pandemic and with the urgency of the pandemic might have met such uh, incredible success. As Michelle Orange wrote, I quote, I knew less about the show than I did about the haste with which people were choking it down. Everyone was inside now. The need to watch a lot of something and then make fun of it appeared vital and universal, a rare source of unity. And you can you know, this is just a selection of three memes which attest to that sense as to how um, uh, people were binging, binging on the show as part of uh, their strategies to cope with the pandemic, if you will. Um, I do argue that, however, for all the strife for evasion, uh, the show still operated on an imagery, symbols, indexes, et cetera, that compelled viewers to think about the pandemic and its effects, even though it wasn't about the pandemic itself. Um, because shows and other entertainment related activities were of course instrumental in carving out these sub narratives that defined and would go on to define that experience of quarantine in the same way that the pandemic itself informed the way that such, that such output was sort of assimilated and consumed. So for example, watching representations of captive wildlife within the context of confinement and isolation presented the sort of unplanned opportunity to empathize with subjects whose movements were curtailed by cages. Caged wildlife shed some interpretive life into the sense of dullness, and demotivation and depression that vast numbers of quarantine people did experience as their psychological time in the nothingness of all our fleeting actions made people, you know, made, it made thinking about time, as I said before, very much unbearable. So during lockdown, we have a number of memes, of course, uh, connecting quarantine with uh, the framing of wildlife in zoo cages. And all of this is circulating through uh, social networks. You have an, a couple of examples there on the screen. So quarantine and isolation uh, precipitated these comparisons with other forms of existing in time and space. And so we were very much invited to reconsider this irreparable damage that we were doing, that we are doing to zoo animals by restricting them from multiple types of freedoms, right? 
And zoos have, of course, this very long history in, in the sort of visual materialization of imperialistic and colonialist practices through which we overpower and alienate and frame everything and anything that falls within that category of otherness, as we all know. Uh, so zoo animals, they're pretty much like museum pieces. They are sort of synecdoches of a world that is slowly disappearing, slowly dying. Um, now, in the follow-up special to the first season of Tiger King, uh, TV personality Joel McHale, uh, he sort of interviewed several members of the cast, not Joe Exotic because he was in jail, uh, but he did a, like a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting or whatnot, and he interviewed um, you know, after the success of the show, he was interested in knowing um, the, the, the participants or, or the cast's reaction. I don't want to call it cast because uh, they, they weren't fictional in a way, so I don't know if that word applies, but anyhow. Anyway, in this, in this special, uh, one of the ex-workers of the GW Zoo, that is Joe Exotic Zoo, said, I quote, I never thought that tigers should be kept in captivity. But I knew the reality of it, and the re reality of it is they cannot be returned to the wild, and there's not much of a wild for them to return to, unquote. And this, of course, this is, this, you know, it probably rings a bell. This position has been very prominent in the articulation of all these discourses that elevate the role of Zeus as these sorts of sanctuaries where the preservation of wildlife is marketed as being the prime purpose. Um, now, it's true that Tiger King does not proactively endorse these sorts of views uh, that cleanse the public image of zoos, but it does develop or it does provide the big cat owners who think that way with ample space in which to develop their ideas. And because these characters, they become so magnetic and so charismatic, well, I would say there's a sense of responsibility to that, okay? Now, um, quarantine also led to two types of, well, several types of, of, of newsworthy uh, uh, stories in terms of wildlife. Um, now, and, and there were those, and this is a case, you know, an interesting case uh, about how the welfare of wild and feral animals had been compromised by the absence of humans, right? So we don't have humans walking around and that compromises the welfare of certain animals. Um, and then we had those stories uh, that said the opposite, that the absence of humans had proven favorable for many species. So within this context, the narrative of zoos, um, of, of how zoos rehabilitate and preserve endangered species um, very much fits within that first group's emphasis on the benefits of human monitoring and surveillance. Um, so according to these stories, dependence on the provision of food, care, exercise, and protection is instrumental for the welfare of, uh, of, of, of wildlife. But sometimes we have these contradicting news. So for instance, on the left of your screen, you have a news, part of a news uh, clip, uh, just a screenshot of a news clip uh, from GW, sorry, from Deutsche Welle, uh, DW, uh, which is Germany's international broadcaster. And that news report is about how there's a German animal rights group who is very much warning the public about the fact that pigeons and city birds are gonna be dying on account of the fact that they don't have uh, people throwing their scraps or their trash around. Uh, but then you have contesting information such as for instance, another animal rights uh, organization, FADA here in Spain, who said quite the opposite, right? And, and said that, um, pigeons would be okay, and they do have the means to find, um, they're resourceful, and they can survive without the intervention of humans in this sense. Um, we also see th those sorts of contradictions during quarantine uh, when we look at poaching, where we have news about quarantine leading to spikes in poaching because, because of the lack of surveillance, because a lot of people are going, you know, looking for, for a, an alternative e economy through which to provide for their families, et cetera. Um, and which of course, uh, that's the way poaching um, tends to go, right? So, so that sort of abuse of the, the last uh, person actually in inhabiting that space. Um, and then we have the opposite sort of news report in a uh, news report saying that uh, uh, there uh, that the numbers in poaching have actually decreased, right? So 
uh, we have contrasting information in that sense. And I think it'll be a while before um, before we get the facts straight. But in any event, uh, having in mainstream media all these contesting narratives about the effects of quarantine on wild non-human animals welfare, I think, favors the questioning of naturalized arguments pertaining to strategies for animal conservation, such as the insistence on zoos as the only viable space in which to protect endangered species. So what I'm saying is that having these news reports floating around when you watch Tiger King, that allows you to question the type of narrative that is being put out by these, uh, by these cast members and potentially by the documentary itself. Um, at the same time, COVID-19 media discourses fed into narratives of loss and death um, and exac exacerbated the threat of extinction in other ways. Uh, the numbers and estimations of the millions of human deaths from COVID, we have the fading of activities and behaviors that were once considered normal. Two minutes? Really? Okay, I thought we had a little bit longer because there wasn't See, another um, speaker, but... Um, I think you started at, uh, uh, so at eight, uh, or, or at 15 or something like that, uh, sorry, at, at five minutes, so uh, six, five. So yeah, I mean, two or oh, three minutes. Okay, yeah, but, but I thought we had a bit longer because we were missing a speaker, uh, but I guess that's fine. So um, I'll try to just, uh, so anyway, there's this whole system way of living that is pretty much uh, disappearance and going obsolete. Um, and in this context of sensibilities, of course, looking at animals that are endangered uh, brings uh, that threat of extinction into a new light. And it's not just uh, the animals that are disappearing, but of course, the subculture of the zoo um, that commercializes them. So um, there's this, uh, as some, the pandemic's assimilation of the new normal assist with Assists, assists, sorry, that interpretation of tigers as this sort of outdated imagery from a culture of domination through manufactured consent, um, a, a culture that systematically marginalized and exploited them. And, and in this sense, as a show streamed during quarantine, Tiger King may have also contributed to naturalizing and collectively easing into a much needed cultural change regarding wildlife management and extinction of zoos. I'm going to just finish up really fast. <laughs> okay. Um, so this marks a stark contrast as well to the multiple sightings that we saw during quarantine of all these wild animals tres trespassing or pretty much claiming urban spaces that they weren't previously allowed to occupy. And of course, that uh, creates this sort of culture, this sort of dissonance with watching at the same time uh, very poorly treated and very abused animals, uh, such as the ones that we have in Tiger King, where they are declawed, they have no veterinary care, uh, they are, you know, they are constantly being bred, and many of these were just uh, uh, cruelly shot. Okay, um, and. We also have a lot of news regarding, of course, wet markets um, and how they, you know, uh, all the discussion going around wet markets in Asia and how that led to racism and, 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 and such forth. But ultimately, what was productive, I would say, about the whole wet market discussion was this idea that we have brought this on ourselves because of how we treat nature, because of how much we neglect it, how much we consume it, how much we exploit non-human others, we have brought this on ourselves. So there's a sense of guilt uh, that has filtered through the, the quarantine uh, narratives. And that also echoes very much uh, some of the statements picked up by Tiger King, uh, this sort of unethical interventionism over natural habitats and, and wildlife. Um, even if it's only for anthropocentric reason, but there's a, there's a, a reasons, there's a sense that nature ultimately should not be tampered with and should not be controlled. And this sort of guilt narrative, this anagnosis, if you will, this hubris um, is just two more slides, slides is pretty much 
put forth in the final episode, episode number seven, towards the end. So we have Eric Cowie, who's a former worker for Joe Exotic and then works for the new zoo owner. Um, and he says about when Joe Exotic came and shot many of these tigers, he says, you know, those cats trusted me and so they could look me in the eye when they died. I was the guy that was right there. That means a minute to me, a heavy minute. We have another um, ex-worker from the GW Zoo, Saf, who echoes a sort of the same feeling and, and, and says, um, nobody wins about the feud, right? That they have constantly. Nobody wins, everybody in involved is a so-called animal advocate. Not a single animal benefited from this war, not a single one. And finally, and this is just the last slide, Joe Exotic himself comes up as somewhat mm, sympathetic at the end of the seventh episode in a sort of rare moment of redemption in which he admits to the suffering that he has inflicted on non-human animal individuals. But mind you that these words, they're not his last words before being jailed at all. This is something they're not clear about when he says this, but he looks younger uh, than throughout the rest of the series. So at some point in his uh, earlier years of the zoo, and he says, are the animals happy? Who the hell knows? I finally moved my two, my two chimpanzees last week, probably one of the hardest days of my life. They sat in cages next to each other for over 10 years, and we moved them to the Great Ape Center in Florida. And in two days, they were out in a big yard hugging on each other. Did I deprive them of that for 10 years? Yep, I deprived them of being chimpanzees. Did I do it on purpose? No, I was wrapped up in having a zoo. So to conclude, in the case of Tiger King, which is so heavily invested in othering the uh, marginal rural white American community that sustains these roadside zoos, conversion narratives function as bridges to human redemption. In the context of the pandemic, narratives of remorse and regret for our treatment of wildlife have played well, even if for purely anthropocentric interests, because they give the illusion that a lesson may have been learned and that reform of the system is in place but the extent to which these beliefs may or may not be self-deluded is yet to be seen in effect. Thank you. <laughs> I just like, ate up half of the, a lot of information, you know, but I hope that was clear. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry about it. We have plenty of time, but still, uh, uh, since you cover uh, a lot of time for or, uh, at least uh, 20 minutes, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, uh, I didn't know when, when it was going to finish. So thank you so much. Uh, it sure was thing. very interesting. And now um, we uh, start, well, we continue with uh, Meg Parrott uh, from Harvard University with a, uh, with a paper titled, uh, Why Do Pandas Have So Little Sex? Two Presentations of Giant Panda Reproduction in Zoo Captive Breeding Programs, uh, 1985-2020. So uh, thank you, Meg. Uh, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, and we can hear you perfectly. Great, and you can see it like advancing? Yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much to the organizers and thank you for having me today. I'm really excited to talk to you about giant pandas, which are notoriously difficult to breed in captivity. Throughout this talk, I'm going to be considering the influence of cultural norms of gender and sexuality on depictions of giant panda reproduction in captive breeding programs. Uh, as a scholar, I studied the relationship between scientific rhetoric that's used to describe endangered species and depictions of endangered species in broader cultural contexts such as uh, popular science magazines and documentary film. In this talk, I argue that both scientific and popular representations persistently describe the behavior of captive pandas through reference to human gender and sexual stereotypes. These stereotypes are normalized and naturalized. Ultimately, I argue that the reproduction of endangered species are articulated through reference to a perceived crisis for the future of masculinity and heterosexuality. So 
So giant pandas are a symbol of the environmental nonprofit World Wildlife Fund. And they've probably raised more funds for conservation than all other species combined. Yet scientists are still struggling to get them to reproduce reliably in captive breeding programs. In 1996, the IUCN captive breeding specialist group met in Chengdu, China, where they estimated that only six living male pandas in captivities had ever mated naturally, which in for them means without artificial uh, reproductive technologies. And in 2004, there was a collaboration between researchers at the San Diego Zoo and Chinese scientists in order to evaluate why these failures um, with reproduction were occurring. Um, the results of the study are, is what's on the slide. And so what they found was that nearly half of mating failures the male uh, mounted but didn't copulate, and in about a third of the mating failures, the males lacked sexual motivation or showed excessive aggression in about 20% of the time. So as scientists interpreted this data, it meant that in the majority of cases, males lacked the sexual motivation to complete successful mating. So this is an example of how popular science reported on the findings of this of these scientific studies. Um, this is from a 2010 Scientific American article, um, which is it's a popular uh, scientific magazine. And the title of the article was Porn for Pandas. And um, as you see on the left, that's uh, allegedly a photo of a panda watching pornography on a computer. And um, the computer is depicting a video of other pandas having sex. And the idea was that pandas were supposed to learn about reproduction through watching um, others. And so here's a, a quote from the magazine, which gives you an idea of how these things were portrayed. So it says that pandas are endangered in part because males prefer eating to mating, that giant a panda dudes in captivity would rather sit around and munch on bamboo than get it on with females. And then the article proceeds to report on several measures that have been used to try to increase male libido in captivity. And here's a list of them. So it was the panda porn exercises, which are um, kind of like physical therapy exercises for them that would uh, strengthen muscles that make them have greater sexual stamina. So a lot of like leg muscles. Um, there was orchestrated quote unquote threesomes where they had multiple males and one female. There was a uh, allegedly use of vibrators, um, Viagra, Chinese herbs, and then what they call panda speed dating, which is basically having a bunch of um, males in cages and letting females go and sort of um, match to which one they liked best. Um, and so these, these efforts are frankly <laughs> very outlandish, um, but it's just interesting to show that this, is, this was the kind of focus that popular science had. Um, this is uh, another example of, so the conservation organization World Wildlife Fund collaborated with the pornography website Pornhub, um, which has like free porn. And what they wanted to do was create a database of videos of panda costumed humans having sex. And the thought was that these were supposed to encourage sexual interest in male pandas. Um, when I spoke with panda scientists about whether this was effective, it seemed like it wasn't, but um, Pornhub also donated a per um, some of the funds to World Wildlife Fund from the videos that were collected. Um, here's another example of gendered rhetoric in the media. So this is from a New York Times article in 2016, where the headline reads, lousy libidos, why do pandas have so little sex? And the opening line reads, pandas are cuddly, but not to each other. They muster about as much enthusiasm for sex as humans do for a root canal. Um, so the, um, as I read the series of clips that I just presented, it is that the media portrays abnormalities of male panda reproductive behavior 
that inadvertently resonate with underlying gendered narratives that portray male pandas as sexually deficient, which reinforces sexual stereotypes of men as being more sexually aggressive or having higher libidos than women. This also reflects um, rhetoric about pandas in captive, or that captive males often lack the supposed quote unquote natural aggression that male pandas have in the wild. So this was a, um, there was a paper that was published in 2015 about mate compatibility in pandas. And this really shifted the conversation from talking about abnormalities in male behavior to instead um, talking about mate choice as an important factor determining the success of captive breeding. So allegedly um, what they found was that pandas uh, have a higher rate of copulating and then having um, babies when they are able to choose their own mates. Um, and so the, these are the results from that study. And um, the most striking one is that 80% of mating, 80% um, led to mating success when both partners were preferred and 90% when uh, with a 90% chance of mating producing a cub. Um, so this is a uh, really in sharp contrast to the 0% in mating success if neither partner was preferred. Um, the article was titled, Do Opposites Attract? And it was written by um, Megan Martin Wintel at the San Diego Zoo. And what I find interesting about this rhetorically is the um, reference to opposites attracting. So in the paper, she's describing how um, there's better mate matching when pandas have contrasting personality traits. So that is kind of what that's referring to in terms of the findings, but it also references this idea of men and women as quote unquote, like opposite sexes and the scientific doctrine of sexual complementarity, which um, is something from the Victorian area that holds that male and female sexualities are polar opposites that complement one another and are determined by biology. In the um, popular science, what we see around the publication of this paper is a reference to heteronormative tropes um, and the focus on the success or failure of heterosexuality. So this is, um, these are some quotes from Live Science and National Geographic in their popular science magazines. Um, the first quote is, females were twice as likely to give birth to cubs if their partner was a love interest rather than just the boring guy next door. So the whole guy next door is a, um, you know, like heteronormative romance trope. The second example here, um, unsatisfying arranged marriages are all too common for pandas. So um, when looking at the context of this quote, what it's referring to is um, analogizing the sort of matching of pandas based on genetics in zoos um, where pandas didn't have mate choice with a tradition of arranged marriages in Chinese culture. And here we see a, um, the role of race in col coloring how sexuality is described in popular culture and popular science. Um, because of the negative connotation of the reference to arranged marriages. So um, there was a resurfacing of debates around um, the sexuality of giant pandas in 2020 and 2021. And this was about, um, or it really encapsulated this idea or concern over masculinity in crisis and the need to sort of revive the natural masculinity of uh, pandas in the wild. So this is a quote from, or this is examples from the Washington Times and it's the uncuddly truth about pandas. So it reads, pandas are tough, sexually potent survivors, not the hapless bunglers we've created as zoo attractions. But the male that wins competition for the female has sex over 40 times in a single afternoon. So here we see males as portrayed as sexually excessive or sexually aggressive. And this is in sharp contrast to the earlier portrayals of males as sexually deficient. Um, and this was picked up by Fox News. Um, and so you, this is a 
like a screenshot from the news program and it alleges that pandas are exposed and that they're sexually aggressive and sex crazed. Um, and so again, we see this focus on tropes of masculinity. So as I've argued, research on captive pandas descri that describes low male libido or male aggression towards females as the primary cause of poor reproductive outcomes. But in 2015, we see a shift from this scientific research to instead emphasizing mate compat compatibility as the central issue in panda captive breeding. Yet, as I've shown through my analysis of both scientific and popular representation, the behavior of captive pandas has been inadvertently but persistently described through human sexual stereotypes that are normalized and naturalized. I argue that these findings are significant because they raise questions about how we frame representations of endangered species in popular culture. Thank you all for listening. I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Meg. Um, so, uh, as people uh, prepare their questions, uh, I see that uh, Thomas uh, has uh, already one question. I do have some of them, but uh, uh, please, Thomas, uh, uh, you can open your mic and ask whatever. Oh, I was I was just clapping. Apologies. That was just the clapping symbol. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't have a specific question as of yet. I'll try to think of one, but I was just clapping for two good presentations. Okay, sorry. I thought uh, for some reason my my brain thought uh, that that was actually uh, a hand and not a clap. Uh, but um, yeah, I do have some uh, some questions. Uh, I will start with uh, Meg. Um, I have actually two questions. Uh, it was a, a, a lovely presentation and I wanted to ask you if during your research, you have, so uh, there is this methodology sort of to um, act with, uh, in a very human way with uh, all these pandas, uh, uh, you know, they uh, give them Vi Viagra or they do this speed dating and these very, very, very human things. And I was wondering uh, if these, if, if, if you know if this is the um, normal way to act with other species when scientists want to um, uh, make them reproduce or if this was something uh, more, uh, I don't know, like a, a desperate approach to, to the matter. And well, you can may perhaps uh, answer this and then uh, let's see if, uh, if I ask the other questions or you continue the speed dating. Great, so thank you so much for that question. Um, so this is part of a larger project, um, my first book, which looks at a series of case studies about the um, role of gender and sexuality in representations of endangered species. And so what I do find across the case studies is that endangered species are often portrayed um, or the crisis, the biodiversity crisis is often portrayed through reference to this perceived crisis of masculinity and heterosexuality in humans. Um, so it, in the sense it does um, reach across species, um, but for captive breeding specifically, there, um, this sort of frenzied of um, anthropomorphism. I think it is a little bit special with pandas because they're charismatic megafauna. Um, and also because they are this kind of um, symbol of environmental environmentalism more broadly. Um, and also because they have they have more difficulties reproducing in captivity than other species. Um, I will say though that there are some parallel case studies. So, um, like cheetahs, for example, they have a lot of difficulties reproducing in captivity, and um, some of the uh, some of like the remedies are are also anthropomorphic. So they've sort of like assigned them um, golden retriever or lab type dogs that are supposed to be their like quote unquote emotional support animals. Um, so I mean that one's a little bit more benign than the camp than the pandas case, but it is similar in terms of having sort of these human interventions into non-human sexuality. Yeah, thanks. And, and so my, my, and my other question was, uh, so related to this 
uh, I guess Pornhub controversy. I, I wouldn't call it controversy. Uh, I was wondering if, if during your research you found uh, scientists or institutions that were against that, not because of the scientific failure of that or, or the scientific possibilities of that, but because of ethical reasons. Because at least to me, uh, what Pornhub did there uh, seemed like a way of greenwash uh, all these controversies that they the company had over all these uh, years on revenge porn or on, on child abuse and all these uh, very, very problematic and of course illegal things. And I was wondering if, uh, if you found people that were, okay, perhaps this might be a solution, but we don't want this solution because it is terribly uh, unethical. Or at least it seems unethical to me, uh, I don't know. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's another great question. So um, scientists do have like a range of perspectives on um, panda captive breeding. I would say the um, the uh, like the approaches that are most compatible with like critical animal studies or animal rights type approaches is scientists that are really concerned about animal welfare. Um, so Megan Martin Wintel and her group at the San Diego Zoo, they don't use um, like the panda porn solution or the vibrators or Viagra. Um, and there's uh, more of an emphasis on having enrichment for animal enclosures or in like uh, bettering the animal's sort of um, even like mental or psychological state and that there's an idea that that would lead to um, higher rates of reproduction. So that's sort of the contrasting case. Um, but most of panda captive breeding is happening in China and there's the goals of those programs aren't always um, just focused on conservation. A lot of it is about the uh, getting pandas to reproduce uh, for entertainment in zoos. And so in those cases, there's not as much of questioning sort of of the ethics of method. It's more about kind of the results that they get. Okay, I see. Yeah, um, perhaps if I, I was wondering, um, yeah, I don't know, like this, uh, perhaps they're using this very, very scientific and materialist mentality. And I don't know, I, I would have issues with allowing that, but uh, it seems that um, they actually were very successful in, in selling this, uh, this marketing campaign as a good thing. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for, for the answer. And now for Claudia, I have also some questions. Um, I don't know if someone wants to uh, intervene here. Uh, if someone wants to, uh, they're very welcome. But if not, um, so you talked about uh, a lot um, about Alejandro. I'm I'm sorry. I, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. I don't know if it's okay. just me, but I I hear you in a very low volume, and and oh. my my computer is like all. It, it must just be me. So, <laughs> so has this been like that for the whole time? Oh my god. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I can prick up my, my, my ears, that's fine. But if you could, it, it's probably my computer. If you could just okay, a little better. bit more. Better, better. Yes, oh, thank you. Awesome, okay. thank you. Apologies. Uh, <laughs> I thought uh, I was sounding perfectly. Um, so yeah, um, um, what I wanted to uh, ask you is, so you mentioned a lot of memes uh, uh, during this uh, pandemic on on captivity and there were also these memes that I remember uh, seeing uh, which basically said well nature is healing right and then we saw these dolphins in Venice or these uh, these other animals that were basically um, uh, it seemed uh, for for the eye of someone who doesn't know uh, about uh, about these things that they were recovering uh, these spaces that uh, have been lost uh, for them. So I was wondering if you have come across uh, these memes and if you think this can, these memes or, or, and these ideas uh, can be linked in a way to, to your project. Because I, I really thought it was really interesting. We had this, these images uh, of captive animals uh, online. And we also have these other images of 
wilderness uh, of animals actually uh, or seemingly uh, uh, reconquering uh, all these spaces that of course after uh, the pandemic if they recovered anything we just reconquered it uh, again so I was wondering your thoughts on this uh, yeah, thank you for your question. I actually had to race through that <laughs> whole section, uh, but I hope the slide was visible. There, uh, as you mentioned, there, there are a lot of uh, reports going around during quarantine, maybe looking at, the, at the, uh, the optimistic side of it, if you will, of all these sightings, right? So we have um, a fox uh, in, in, in London or whatever, or a boar in wherever, dolphins, whatever. Uh, flamingo colonies uh, everywhere, right? And these these sightings, which uh, uh, were again perceived as uh, a, as a sort of hopeful reminder that perhaps uh, you know if we take a step back, there is uh, some possibility of recovery um, on on the part of endangered species and whatnot. And just you know, just a few weeks of of lockdown, how much uh, can be done clearly, uh, not a lot, but it's also it's always good to know that those visual cues are there uh, to motivate people. And I think that particularly since this conference is is in in America, right, uh, American pop culture, um, I think that makes a lot of sense within the United States because more so than any other uh, Western nation, there's so much about American identity. Um, an American nationalist sentiment based on the concept or the cultural construct of the wilderness, right? Um, and of course, this is Roderick Nash's um, famous theory in Wilderness in the American Mind from 1963. So yeah, definitely. I mean, all those uh, sightings and news reports that we have of, of, of wild animals, it might be some people were would say it might be that you don't have the human distractions in the way and so you're more perceptive of whatever movement is going on or you know since uh, other than COVID there's only so much that can happen in spaces if, in which we don't have human activity so they they are hard things to measure right to what extent can we say uh, that you know uh having seen a dolphin swimming somewhere uh, maybe we missed it last time, you know, we've missed it many times or whatnot, but more important to the, more important than, you know, the, is the effect, that sort of effective response that people get out of that. And um, yeah, sure. I mean, multiple memes and, 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 you know, we've lived off memes, we've lived off uh, uh, social network uh, humor and, and parody and irony and whatnot, um, and they they are sometimes downplayed, and I think they they very much are able. Meme culture is a complicated thing, of course, uh, but the fact that we are so driven by the immediacy of the image and that our encounter with non-human animals tends to be more through representation or through pieces of them than an actual encounter with a non-human animal. It's, it's an interesting way through which to mediate that, uh, that encounter. So my case point in, in, in talking about that in, in the presentation was to say, well, how do pe people who are both consuming Tiger King and at the same time are getting all these news reports about wildlife sightings and wet markets and, uh, you know, and what, how human activity either curtails or, or, you know, or, or benefits uh, wildlife, how does, how, how does it become palatable? How does it digested by this massively confused uh, million, in these massively confused millions of people just being locked up in their home? Uh, so I, I don't have any conclusive evidence in terms of how people responded 100%, but I can only think because I, I checked my own response at the time and I'm thinking, okay, all these contradicting messages regarding wildlife, what do we do? How is the, what does this tell me about how I can interpret the documentary now, right? I don't know if that answers your question or I'm just- Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 think it actually, I think it actually links with, uh, uh, with my second question, which was, uh, which is, um, 
after you have the feeling that even though uh so of course uh uh tiger king is not a, a documentary about king no. about about tigers it's uh about uh people in the midwest or or a very stereotype stereotyped uh uh view of uh of the midwest and i was wondering if if Tiger King is actually uh, a documentary that poses all these um, all these characters uh, as not animals, but definitely something more similar to animals, because in the end you don't, even though they are very charismatic, you still see them as another, right? As yeah, the, the other rural uh, um, uh, subjectivity that uh that in the end is more similar to to the tiger that is enclosed in the zoo than to you right and everything that you see on on that show uh, at least the, the main protagonist uh, they you clearly see them as as monsters basically as human monsters which in a way is uh, a way of saying that these people are more animals uh in in the way they react to things and particularly tiger king uh, the way he reacts to things is uh, it feels as if it was intentionally uh, animalized, right? So I was wondering your your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The show uh, really capitalizes on uh, ridiculing and humiliating and just making fun of, of these people, of course, um, at the same time, who at the same time exploit um exploit these these uh, these wild uh cats and and other wildlife and it's um it, 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 the thing about it is that it, it it's it's a mix it, it capitalizes on that and and that's why it leads to that choking down of me mean culture because they have that sort of a magnetic appeal that perhaps you get in reality TV and in true crime serials. Um, so of course, there's when Newer refers to the glamorizing, she's not exactly saying, you know, that these are glamorous people at all. These are very unfortunate um, uh, people, of course, but they're also exploiters and 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 abusers and very abusive of one another. Absolutely. Uh, so it, it, it makes fun of that. Now, the interesting thing about Tiger King, I, 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 I've never thought that it's the show itself. It's how people have uh, sort of digested it. And we're not talking just about meme culture. We're talking about um, uh, somebody called it, some critic called it uh, TV justice or whatever, uh, because precisely of the amount of support that, for instance, uh, Joe Exotic has gotten uh, from the from uh, from the audience, and the amount of hatred that Carol Baskin, who's the one that he plotted to murder, and who is uh, uh, also uh, an unofficial murder suspect herself of her first husband. So there are a lot of there's a lot of weird stuff there, but who is technically more of a conservationist than um uh, or certainly that's her her narr her discourse right and just how much that moved people in terms of uh ridiculing uh parroting and uh, uh and 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 also a lot of hatred online hatred absolutely so that clouds uh the the more important issue obviously which is that of um, endangered, very direly endangered species. And I think that the documentary, again, towards the end, all of a sudden it turns, uh, it veers into this uh, narrative that it has for the last, the, the previous six episodes sort of forgotten about and, and just left on the side. And it deviates into this uh, sort of, well, all oh, the tigers, you know, they're disappearing and more more of a conservationist discourse, which it has fa completely failed to develop in the previous um, episodes. And uh, so, of course, all these all these people that are just paraded as if it were a sort of freak show. OK, uh, that is why it, it, it people binge on it so much, because it has that quality, absolutely, of, of reality TV and of of um, 
of a, a, a true crime serial, I would say. So yeah, definitely it's a, it's a, and, and, you know, it's a very vivid portrayal of your rural white Trumpian sort of um, people that you have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, actually, I think there is even uh, one moment in the series in which uh, he goes to a Trump meeting uh, uh, or something. Sure. Um, I mean, he, he tries to run for president too. Yes. At a given yes point. True. So um, Anna has a, a, another question, right? Yes. And it's for Meg. And I, I don't know if uh, my perspective is European. Like we maybe we haven't had that much interest uh, in the sex life of pandas over here. I don't feel it's a topic that has been, uh, you know, overly uh, televised, for example. Maybe you can see some news, but it's not something so uh, popular or widespread. Uh, so I was just wondering how how does this issue and this type of representation, so the mm, lack of interest in sex and uh, all of these uh, other uh, interpretation and the sex crazed panda and stuff like that, how does that uh, relate to the cute panda image? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I would say that the majority of representation that I see on a on an average basis is the cute panda, is the panda for kids. It's always a type of, as you were saying, the endangered species tend to uh, attract a certain kind of, uh, you know, interest, appeal. Uh, so I don't know. My niece, for example, has a bunch of, she's four, and she has a bunch of books with cute pandas that do cute things, you know. So how do you think this, these two images that are quite, uh, clashing or on very different uh, types of uh, levels and discourses, how do they cope with one another in, in the popular uh, culture sp sphere? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. That's a really good one. Um, so I think it has sort of changed a bit historically. So in the first period where there's the focus on pandas as sexually deficient, I think that that actually fits in perfectly with the cute image because um, the whole like turning pandas into sort of a cartoon is um, involves desexualizing them in a way um, and sort of distancing them from like anything that would not be family friendly, I guess. <laughs> um, and then the second period where there's the focus on mate compatibility, it's, um, I think it's compatible with the cute thing too, because there's, um, there, like, there's a documentary that, for example, that shows like a male and, uh, and a female panda, like falling in love and like tumbling around in like a very like romantic, sweet way. And so it kind of, um, it, in a way it like ties into sort of like romantic fairy tales that like are you know are family friendly too um and then there's like the sex crazed example and like the panda porn example which are complete outliers and like I'll say that that isn't constituting the bulk of discourse those are sort of underlying um like sub narratives and so like the the panda craze thing is a direct um is in direct opposition, I think, to the cute panda phenomenon. Um, and yeah, that's a that's like a really good thing to think about because I agree that most of panda representation does do that. The sort of um, the subset of that that is focusing on panda reproduction and captive breeding program is a little different. And there's like ways that it's compatible and then moments where it's not. I love your hair too, by the way. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you for the answer as well I mean I think it's it's very interesting because uh, it's like I, I don't know to me it's it's curious because I'm like do we really uh, care I mean care uh, like do I want to be updated about <laughs> uh, you know it seems a bit uh, sort of why you're 
kind of uh, attitude to me to have it on the news, you know, like this is this is a problem and this is how we're solving it, you know. It's not just something that you would find because you're interested in the topic. So it did seem a bit uh, like the Tucker Carlson uh, screenshot that you put. It, it does give me a bit of a creepy wire vibe that all the, yeah. you know, interest. <laughs> mm-hmm um on the the note of the voyeurism so and this actually links to claudia's presentation there were increased rates of mating in zoos with pandas um during the pandemic because there was supposedly because there's less um zoo visitors and so um the pandas felt more comfortable so they were able to reproduce and the headlines would be like like decreased zoo um attendance leads to like Panda, pandas having sex for the first time in 10 years and then there would be like a photo of them you know having sex and so yeah you're right it has like a voyeur spectacle kind of feel which we I mean we do see this in a lot of endangered species and wildlife um, yeah and I mean maybe that is the solution they shouldn't live constantly under the uh, you know, the eye of so many people, maybe well, that, uh, you know, but of course, usually pandas are if, if, used. If I may chime in there, and Meg, I absolutely loved your presentation, and I love what, I love what you're um, doing research on, and we've actually um, been given here as well, a research project on representations of gender in, in, in animal ethics documentaries so i i think that oh. maybe we could be <laughs> we could stay in touch um, um yeah I'd love, I'd love to hear uh about your work in progress and and what you're doing um but in in reference to what um to what anna was saying of course um uh brett mills who was the uh, keynote in this um in this uh uh in this in this conference sorry <laughs> tired. Um, he has that wonderful article about, he has two wonderful articles which are very relevant uh, to this entire discussion. One is the animals went in two by, by two and he talks about heteronormativity and the representation of non-human animals in documentaries and how that relates to our very, still very conservative perceptions of um, gender and and family structures but he also has and this is in reference to what Anna was suggesting um, he explores you know the notion of privacy in terms of you know do what does privacy mean for um, different um, I know he doesn't like the word species so I'm not going to use that but for different uh, for different animals right so what does um, privacy, you know, when you have animals that with every um, part of their body, they are um, signaling that they don't want to be watched, surveilled, monitored, uh, that they have uh, their impulses to run away or to hide or to camouflage. What does it mean when we pry into their, you know, activities or, or, or behaviors that maybe we perceive as intimate, but you know, there's a level of intimacy to that as well. Um, so it's very interesting research going on in there that, that I think is, is still in dire need of attention. And, and um, you know, just hearing about your research, Meg, I think that that's fascinating. And, and, and it reminded me very much of, yeah, of, of uh, I'm a big fan of Brett's and, and of course that, um, how he brings that into the, into the discussion as well. Sorry, I'm rambling again. Thank you. Oh, it's great. Thank you. Okay, so I think we are uh, on perfect timing here uh, to wrap this up, to uh, thank uh, uh, both Claudia and Meg. Uh, it was uh, a, an astonishing uh, session. I, I really loved it. Uh, so thank you. Thank you both. Uh, it was uh, awesome, this debate and, and your presentations.